Welcome to Quincy in Focus, Quincy Access TV's news magazine show. My name is Mandy Flaherty. And my name is Sherry Kajus. Welcome to the Quincy in Focus 2019 Top 25 Countdown, where we look back at the top 25 stories covered on Quincy in Focus this year. There are so many stories and events each year in Quincy, it's tough to narrow down the top 25 choices. From news stories, sports and community events, we've tried to create just a glimpse into what 2019 offered the city of Quincy. Let's get things started. Coming in at number 25 on the countdown for the 87th time, the Quincy Presidents and North Quincy Red Raiders met on the football field for the city championship trophy. The Raiders were looking for a fourth straight victory on Thanksgiving Day, while the Presidents were hoping to start a winning streak of their own. North Quincy would get first crack to score on Thanksgiving morning. And first thing started off by Tyler Lee, the running back for the Red Raiders. Nice run here and is going to put the Red Raiders into President's territory. On the very next play, though, the ball is going to come loose out of the shotgun. Cooper Hansen cannot hold on to it. Tyler Lee cannot get it either for the Red Raiders. And the Presidents pick the ball up in North Quincy territory. On the next play, the President's quarterback, Drew Brady, is going to go back to pass, but a great play right there by Liam Hines for the Raiders on the interception to get the ball right back to North Quincy. On the very next play, another fumble. Tyler Lee cannot get the exchange from Cooper Hansen, and now the President's recover as well. Quincy on the very next play is going to hand it off to their star running back Isaiah Steinberg, his first carry of the day, and he's going to go to the left side. Ball comes loose again, and North Quincy recovers four plays and four consecutive turnovers. Things finally settle down now and move to the second quarter, and Quincy High School is driving down the field. They're at the North Quincy 24-yard line. Drew Brady looking into the corner of the end zone for Derek Little, and a great job there by Little. He taps his feet to stay in bounds, and the Presidents strike first. They're up. 7 nothing. Comes right back and gets On the ensuing drive now for the Red Raiders. Red Raiders. Quarterback Cooper Hansen is going to have another well, pass tipped, tipped as he goes back to pass. Desmond. And it's going to get intercepted by Devin Desmond. And North Quincy cannot get things going. Desmond with a nice return here for the Presidents. And that's going to set them up here as they try to go down the field and score again. Later on this drive, the presence the now at the five-yard line. Five They're going to hand it off to Steinberg. Over to the left side, down. and he's going to go into pay dirt. Quincy in strikes in again. Point after is missed. Quincy up now 13 to nothing. Later now in the second quarter, the presidents are able to force a North Quincy turnover on downs with under a minute to go in the half. Barretti passes over to Desmond. Desmond, a great play, running down the left sideline, makes one man miss right there, and he's going to go into the end zone. A 62-yard touchdown pass, and Quincy is now up 20 to nothing with 39 seconds left to go in the first half. North Quincy trying to get something going before the half ends. And it's going to be a handoff to Josh Jackson. But a huge hit by Bobby Janig. And North Quincy cannot get into the end zone. It's 20 to nothing at the half. North Quincy driving down the field now in the third quarter. Hanson looking down the field and finds an open Andrew God who comes loose for a 17-yard pass and complete. Later on in the drive, Hanson looking down for Colm Gary. But a great deflection right there by Matt Kelly to prevent the touchdown. However, North Quincy would go down and get six points. They drive down the field. They're at the one-yard line. Josh Jackson gets it again. He puts it into the end zone, and North Quincy gets on the board. 20-6 to six is the score. North Quincy is able to get six points on the board, but it's just too much defense here today for the Presidents as Matthew McGinnis comes in and makes the big sack on Hanson, and Quincy's going to win the ball game by a score of 20-6. to six. Quincy's defense coming out outstanding plays all game long for the victory. Quincy High School. City Champs! At number 24, Quincy College celebrated the commencement of its 2019 class at the South Shore Music Circus in Cohasset. Speakers at the commencement included Mayor Thomas P. Koch, commencement speaker State Representative Ronald Mariano, and class speaker Clinice Tamara DeBrito. Graduates, you did it. You attended classes. You completed assignments. You passed tests, you wrote reports, you prepared projects, you made presentations, 
and then you spend many more hours at work, all at the same time that you're taking care of a home, family, and each other. Congratulations. There is nothing easy about what you accomplished. And now you know you can. Now you know you can. My heartfelt congratulations to each and every one of you. God bless and enjoy the day. To our graduates this morning, I just want to offer my personal congratulations to each of you. Uh, the, the president uh, spoke from the various communities and countries where you come from. You chose Quincy College. And I want to express my gratitude to the faculty and staff who worked so well and hard on your behalf so that you can enjoy your great to hear, uh, date here today. I also want to offer my congratulations to your families. I can see the pride in your families, the faces around this room here today. So go get them, chase your dreams, conquer the world. God bless you all, congratulations. True happiness and meaning comes from human connection. And not just with the people in the office, it comes from the people at your kitchen table, in your neighborhood, in your church, a place of worship. Never forget that you are an asset to your community, and your community needs you. Look to it for... <laughs> Look to it for strength and meaning. If we all make a little extra effort to be more involved in our communities, just maybe we can bring some, some more sense and decency to our country into the world. And with that, I wish you all the best of luck in your new endeavor, and congratulations to all the graduates. Thank you very much. Sometimes we are so focused on our objectives that we can't see the, increment, that we can't see the increments of change that have led us to our accomplishments. Personally, I recently discovered that in order to succeed in any aspect of life and reach the goals that we set for your, ourselves, we need to acknowledge who, you, who we are, learn from our mistakes, and find our path. Here at Quincy College, we, we merge to form a melting pot of students, all striving to achieve the same goal, graduation. What I didn't realize soon enough was that even though we're all here to accomplish the same goal, we achieve our goals by following our own unique path. So my advice to you, class of 2019, is find your path and design your life in the line and design your life in line with the, with the strengths you possess. Don't withhold from the world all the potential you have to offer. Members Make the Difference has been a long-standing motto at QATV. Hardworking and dedicated volunteers help QATV fulfill its mission to bring local television programming to the residents of Quincy. To thank them, QATV holds an annual appreciation evening and it comes in at number 23 on our countdown. Okay, this next award is called Fine on Nine. And it's really, uh, it's an award that's awarded to I would say an association that we have with the Quincy Public Schools. We are part of the school community partnership. And through that, we have students from the broadcasting class at Quincy High School join us and produce programs. They will assist on programs that uh, we have put together in studio and they will create some PSAs, some public service announcements themselves. This was all arranged through Keith Sagala and John Green, and I know John Green is here, so John, I'd like to, pronounce, to present rather the Fine on Nine award to you. This again is Quincy Access Television and the Quincy School Community Partnership. Thank you very much. This is very kind of QATV. It is, uh, we really appreciate it, and we're very, very happy to do the service that we do for the blind. But also, I want to thank certainly Betty, who Betty is now a member of the Quincy Lions Club and as the executive director has also done the reading, so thank you, Betty. Um, the reason you do these things is for the kids. And um, I think as a coach and as a, a former teacher and a guidance counselor, uh, your focus is always on the kids. And that's the reason uh, I was in the business for all those years, and that's why I continue to be on the school committee. Uh, and. Uh, hopefully it will be on for another four years, but um, again, it's just it's for the kids. Um, I don't watch myself on the bench standing up and uh, getting on the officials. It's, it's um, 
watching the kids and making sure that they, they get some enjoyment out of watching themselves uh, on TV. Um, so again, I, I, it's a labor of love. It's something I love doing. Uh, I love coaching. I uh, love being with the kids. And uh, I love being associated with QATV and all the great people here. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I have put myself into QATV because I enjoy helping the community. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, of course, my audio stuff has been helpful, um, but I'm, you know, I'm really happy when I'm out uh, shooting things. I'll be doing um, uh, the next uh, Quincy Symphony Orchestra. I did the science fair. Um, that was a lot of fun. I had a great time, and I think the kids really learned a lot from it. And that's what I care about, is helping them learn more about themselves, too. So thank you very much. The 2020 U.S. Census is just around the corner, and it will be an important count in Quincy, as city officials hope to see over 100,000 residents counted. At Census Kickoff Press Conference, Jeff Beller, Regional Director of the U.S. Census Bureau based in New York, focused on its importance, how easy it is to compete, and the safety of the information gathered, and it comes in at number 22 on our list. So I'm going to borrow a, a tagline that we used in, in 2010. We talked about how the census was safe, that it, that it was easy, and that it's important. So first off, let me start out with it's safe. Probably one of the biggest concerns that we have regarding the current uh, environment that we're in is the, uh, for the public to give us information. All right. We still have Title 13, a federal law that prohibits the use, the sharing of any data we collect at a household or person level. What does that mean? That means you're providing your census information to the Census Bureau. We cannot release your household information to anyone for any reason, not to the IRS, not to any law enforcement agency, not to any member of, of government or Congress. It is protected by Title 13. It would take an act of Congress to change that. So the data that you give us is safe. We never ask for Social Security numbers. We never ask for bank account information. We never ask for money. If you hear that, you need to let us know. Let me talk about the four ways you can fill out your census form in 2020. First off, John mentioned online. We're excited about this. Uh, it not only does it reduce costs, it improves quality. So you'll be able to fill your uh, census response online in both English and 12 non-English languages. That'll be supported. You basically go to a drop down, you choose your language, you can fill out your census form online. So the first mail out we do to the majority of the country it will not be a census form. It's going to be an invitation to go online. This is your census ID. And just think of it, the census ID as a replacement for your address. Instead of keying in your address, you're going to key in the census ID. Then when you start to, to put in the data uh, for your household, behind the scenes, we're matching that data you enter to your address. The point of that is that when we release the data, we're releasing it in the right place. Our job is to count everyone, to count them once and only once and in the right place. Second, over the phone. So we've always provided toll-free support. We're gonna to provide toll-free support again, but for the first time, we'll actually collect information over the phone if people wanna provide their information over the phone, all right? That will also be in English and 12 other non-English languages provided by our telephone support centers. The third way is a paper form. So certain areas of the country, the very first mail out they get will be a paper form. Every address across the country by the time we do our fourth mail out in April, if we haven't received a response from your particular address, 101 Main Street, we haven't received a response, we're gonna mail out a paper questionnaire. So people still have the ability to fill it out on form, on paper. And then lastly, the most costly thing we do in any sense, this is what an operation, what we call non-response follow-up. We hired over 500,000 people nationwide for roughly eight to 12 week operation in 2010. We're anticipating the need to hire over 350,000 people nationwide in 2020 to go out there and knock on doors to ask those very same questions that are on the census form, that are on the internet, that you can provide over the phone. So those are to be the four ways that you can respond to your census in 2020. At number 21 on the countdown, the city of Quincy was one of a select group of municipalities to host an exhibit featuring photographs of President John F. Kennedy. It featured 77 images of the former president. Students from Quincy High School's broadcasting class viewed the traveling museum and asked Mayor Thomas P. Koch about the significance of the Quincy visit. 
Mayor Tom Koch, uh, Quincy Mayor, and uh, thrilled to be here to talk about the JFK exhibit. Well, City Quincy has a lot of history, and uh, JFK is part of our city's history. He's, he visited the city a number of times um, yeah, when he was U.S. Senator, and then, of course, when he ran for, went for president. He was a congressman representing the Charlestown part of Boston originally. Uh, but Stephen uh, Kennedy Smith, who would be a nephew to JFK, uh, put a book together celebrating his 100th years uh, since his birthday. And Doug Brinkley, who was a famous photographer, um, uh, incorporated all the photography that he had relating to Kennedy into the book. So out of that book came this collection of photographs that has been going around different parts of the state and country at different times of the year. So we were thrilled to get it uh, put here, uh, I think, the end of September. There's a lot of great photographs here, um, but the one that um, uh, on the tarmac where Lyndon Johnson was vice president, he's yelling at the pilots, and you can see the anger in his face because the, the pilots were Republicans and they were running it purposely so people couldn't hear Kennedy speak. And you could see Kennedy holding back Lyndon like Lyndon was going to take a, a punch at one of the pilots. I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty cool. The emotion shown in both faces was, was pretty neat. He actually ran for vice president in 1956, um, and he was beaten by Estes Kefauver. Uh, the ticket was Adlai Stevenson and Estes Kefauver. Uh, but it put Kennedy in the national scene at that time because he did so well and was so well admired. Um, so there's a connection obviously with my family. Um, my dad was one of 15 organizers in Massachusetts at the time with Larry O'Brien who was the chief organizer. Larry O'Brien became the postmaster general under Kennedy and then later became the NBA commissioner. Uh, was, was quite a guy. There's also a connection between the city. Um, I know he had great admiration for the Adamses and their contributions to our nation's history and spoke of them at different times. Um, and he probably more than any in modern history evoked this sense uh, in average citizens about service. Um, you know, his famous quote, as not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, we could use that today. Um, and he, he created the Peace Corps. And it was a whole new feeling uh, of engagement with government back then in a positive way. Um, he was quite a, he was really a special leader. He wasn't there long enough to really judge him uh, history-wise on how effective he was over time because he, unfortunately, his life was cut short by an assassin's bullet back in 63 uh, in Dallas, Texas. So, um, but he definitely um, created a generation of, of people that got into politics because of he, his inspiration. We're standing in what is um, a meeting room, um, a part of the old town hall that was completely renovated just a few years ago. On the other side of the wall, uh, across the way here, is the museum, which has a lot of artifacts and speaks to our history as a city. On the wall facing this room are all the mayors since 1889, since we became a city. Um, in fact, there's, some, there's uh, one of the Adamses, he went on to become the Secretary of the Navy under, Navy under President Herbert Hoover. So uh, this building evokes history. I mean, it is a uh, great space. So we see, we see down the road there'd be other exhibits that would, that would come here, um, you know, whether they're historic or cultural or, or otherwise, uh, we'll be open to that. Um, we have a regular visitation program now, so people that are in the area visiting, it, it gives them an opportunity to see something, you know, more interesting or something different than what is normally in the building. So I definitely see more exhibits coming this way, um, and uh, who knows, the sky's the limit. At number 20, Father Bill's in Main Spring held their 25th annual food fest at the Hingham Shipyard in the summer. 1,000 guests, vendors, and volunteers attended the event, raising more than $350,000 to help Father Bill's assist 6,000 people each year in their mission to prevent and end homelessness. And the event comes in at number 20 on our countdown. I want to welcome everybody to the 25th year of our annual food fest and auction. This event um, really make sure that we can take care of all the homeless families and individuals across the greater Quincy South Shore area. Um, every night we average about 255 individuals and 133 families that have no place to go. And the state only pays about 50% of the need. So tonight, we have over 40 corporate sponsors. We have over 45 restaurants. And um, we have a, a silent auction tonight where we hope to bring in over $300,000 to fill that gap to make sure that nobody is sleeping outside. If it's our kids and our parents, if it's our veterans, for 
our elderly people. Um, tonight is a night that really 87 cents to every dollar goes right to the people we assist. So we are very blessed with all the support we get from the greater Quincy South Shore area. And um, it's our 25 years. This started with my father, Bill McCarthy, personally. He started this event to make up the gap from the public funding. And we're just blessed to have all of the support tonight. So thank you. Wonderful event for Father Bills. Uh, many folks are very familiar with Father Bills and the great work they do, not only in Quincy, but throughout the South Shore. We're grateful for the efforts of John, his entire team, all the volunteers and staff, and particularly tonight, all the sponsors and those folks that are uh, giving up some, uh, some treasure to help with the cause. I also want to take a minute to congratulate George Burke and his family for the continued contributions they make to the great city of Quincy and beyond. So congratulations to all, and thanks for all the great work. The reason why I'm here tonight, the 25th anniversary of Father Bills, is because I knew the man personally. He was instrumental in the initial aging of my uh, recovery in, uh, out of uh, substance abuse back in 1984 to 85. And uh, he actually got me out of drugs, <laughs> to be frank with you. Drugs, dealing, alcohol. And I've been sober over 33 years now. So certainly George Burke being the district attorney at the time, you know, and it's his uh, commemoration tonight, wanted to be here. You got Mayor Koch here and you got Mr. Yaz in there, not Yastrzemski, Yaz, the director, all these wonderful people. So I wanted to come and support and lend my support and flew up for this. And uh, this is a worthwhile cause and it's a great uh, charity. It's a great event. There are so many people who are in difficulty in life with substance and alcohol, emotional situations, financial situations. And Father Bills has been a cornerstone in helping people to overcome these adversities in today's very complicated society. So having known the man personally, Father Bill that is, uh, it would uh, be amiss of myself and my family, all 15 of us, not to be here tonight. So it's a worthwhile cause and, you know, nice food. But that's that's just the the icing on the cake. The real reason why we're here is because people care. People care about the uh, people who don't have an opportunity to get the break that they need. And Father Bill was instrumental in that. That's why I'm here with these beautiful people. I'm George Burke and I'm receiving the top award from the Father Bills tonight and I think it's the biggest honor I've ever received in my life. And that is because I believe deeply in the cause that Father Bill stands for. Number 19, Quincy Community Action Programs held its best chef competition. Attendees enjoyed food, drinks, and raffles, while local chefs prepared meals with surprise ingredients for a panel of judges. Proceeds from the event went to QCAP, an organization dedicated to preventing hunger. Hi, I'm Beth Ann Strollo. I'm the CEO of Quincy Community Action Programs, and we are the community action agency that serves Quincy and all the surrounding South Shore communities. Um, tonight is our Best Chef event. This is an annual fundraiser that we do in October where we invite five chefs and restaurants to compete against each other, uh, sort of in the um, concept of the Food Network Show Chopped. It's a fun competition, all to raise money for the programs that we deliver at QCAP that help low-income people. They will get secret ingredients from our food pantry. We have a food center over in Southwest Quincy where we provide food to um, eligible residents to help them eat nutritiously. And this is a night where we have the chefs create a gourmet dish out of ingredients that we normally provide to our clients at the food center. Um, we're so excited about tonight, our best chef competition. Uh, it's our big fundraiser of the year. And the money from this event primarily goes to our food center in Quincy that provides uh, free food to a lot of Quincy residents and, and the residents outside of Quincy who need help. 
Hey folks, Barbara Isola. Um, you may recognize me from Into the Frying Pan, but I'm here at this wonderful Best Chefs uh, event at, for QCAP. Uh, I'm one of the judges, so I get to try all the unbelievable creations that the chef uh, present us with. So ladies and gentlemen, please let's hear it for our celebrity chefs as they bring out the secret ingredients. The baskets contain basic ingredients, all commonly provided to QCAP clients at the food center. And then as you know, the, boat, the chefs will have 30 minutes to concoct their perfect dish, which will be judged, and one of them will go home to be with it tonight, Sarah. These are the five ingredients. Grapes, elbows, I'm assuming that means pasta, eggplant, cranberry jelly, and pollock. Anyway, um, the two co-winners are Townsend and Navarra. The South Shore YMCA hosted their annual Taste of the South Shore event at Lombardo's in Randolph, raising over $380,000 for the organization. Stay Strong, a new program focusing on providing resources to families affected by cancer, was also announced during the event, and it comes in at number 18 on our Top 25 Countdown. It, it, it was a great crowd. I think it's the most ever. We had well over 700 folks here uh, and supporting the cause that we have for tonight. And that, and that cause is called the Stay Strong. And it's a program to work with people who are going through cancer, their families and their caregivers to help support them through their journey through cancer. You know, we have such great medical facilities in the region, the hospitals, so the medical part is taken care of. But what happens after they go through treatment, or even during going through treatment, to support their families, to make sure kids can still be kids and participate in camp programs and other sports programs at the Y, and then also support programs for the caregivers, who are family members a lot of times that are all, you know, sometimes not thought of. They're always, they're always supporting the person with cancer. And so we, we have this wraparound program of a year's free membership, free babysitting for those parents who have kids when they have to go to doctor's appointments or go to a chemotherapy or radiation, they can drop them off at the Y. Free camp for those kids so they can be kids again, you know, when they're wrapped up in the, this awful disease of cancer. Help seniors as well. Oh, absolutely. So we have support groups throughout the week, every single week for a whole year to work with them. And then we have some counseling nutrition counseling, 
We have faith counseling if people want to reconnect with faith. And we have financial consulting because this could take a financial toll on a family as well. This is great. Uh, we're very appreciative of um, you know the People's Choice Award. Everybody voted for us and uh, we're just extremely thrilled to be here. We're extremely thankful that we're part of this. This is extremely important work that we all need to do. We need to do this for the community. Everybody needs to come together. This is good food. Good food brings good food brings everyone together. So we're excited. We're super excited. Hi, I'm Lauren Delolio. I'm Vice President of Communications for the South Shore YMCA. We're here at the 23rd Annual Taste of the South Shore, and it's been an incredible event. We raised a lot of money. We're still waiting for that final count that we'll announce tomorrow. We're helping people all across the South Shore to live a stronger life, especially those who are dealing with cancer and a cancer diagnosis. So we want to thank all of these amazing chefs that came out. The food was incredible, the drinks were incredible, the crowd was incredible. I'd say this was our best year ever. Uh, my name is Chrissy Shaha. I am the executive director of the Quincy and Germantown Neighborhood Center for the South Shore YMCA. Uh, we're here at the Taste of the South Shore event and it was a fantastic night with good food, good drinks, and most of all good people. Uh, we were very successful with our fundraising. As Lauren said, we're waiting for our final count, but um, really the ability to introduce a program that has the ability to touch and affect so many lives, uh, both for those that are cancer survivors going through cancer treatment uh, or caregivers for those uh, that are undergoing treatment. At number 17, Dave Hoffman, CEO and President of Duncan Brands, was the keynote speaker at the Quincy Chamber of Commerce's annual business showcase. Hoffman spoke about Duncan Brands' proud associations with Quincy and the importance of looking to the future and moving with the markets. This is our birthplace and when Tim called, you know, you can't deny coming back to your birthplace. So um, we get asked to do a lot, but when Quincy calls, we drop everything and come and you always know that, and the mayor knows that as well. Um, this is where we belong. This is our home, this is our heritage, and when we opened up in 2018 our Next Generation Restaurant, it's where our heritage met our future. This was a place where, still today in this industry, hard work, dedication, passion, commitment gets rewarded. And it still does today, and that's what's always driven me. For 25 years, I've been waking up at 5, 5.30 a.m., looking at sales every day, sales and traffic. So, you know, and I see a lot of people around here, a lot of other small business owners, you know, if you don't love the hot breath of that scorecard, this is, being a small business owner or in this business, this is the wrong business for you. Every day you get a scorecard on what your day was the previous, you know, the previous day was for you and you get that scorecard and it tells you what the customer just said about you, about your strategies, about your tactics, what they think of you, and that's really the lifeblood of being a franchisee and the lifeblood of being a small business owner. The world is changing, and we did a study about two or three years ago, and in that study it said, in today's world of changing customer demands, Brands and companies that don't change will face a 3% innovation penalty. And so what that means is, no matter what you do, if you're a great brand, if in 2018 you delivered a $1 of sales and you did everything exactly the same, in 2019 your sales will be 97 cents. That's how quickly everything is changing in the world. Victor mentioned it, technology, right? Customer choice changing needs, the Amazon effect. Everything is changing rapidly, and we have to be prepared to change with these times. As I've talked to many people, many young people, culture is everything today. You know, you can have great companies, you can have great brands, but if you don't fit into the culture and the fabric of that company, you will not succeed. Character um, and DNA is really built for us on who we are over the seven years as a brand. And I like to say, actions determine results, but it's your character that determines your destiny. But I'd say the other thing is kindness. 
and making sure that you give back to the communities you serve. You know, we're proud to operate in a community like Quincy. We're proud, we feel local, you know, this is where we started. And today, it's so important that companies have shared value. At number 16, Governor Charlie Baker visited the North Quincy High School to help plant the 20,000th new tree as a part of the Greening Gateway Cities program, an initiative to increase the tree canopy by 5% in urban neighborhoods, including parts of Germantown, Wollaston, and North Quincy. Today we're going to uh, commemorate the planting of the 20,000th tree through the Greening the Gateway Cities program. This was a brainchild of the baker Polito administration to try to encourage the Great Way cities to have more of an urban tree canopy. And I'm sure other spe speakers will talk a little bit about the tremendous benefits that trees bring to our environment and the future benefits that they're going to bring to climate change resiliency as the climate changes in the future. In our city, uh, and thank you again, Governor, for another time visiting our city. He knows his way around here. He's been here a number of times. Uh, but thank you for this, this initiative and all the great work you've done uh, for the benefit of the people of Quincy, but also the people of the Commonwealth. What I would say about, to follow up on Commissioner Roy's comments, what I would say about this planting exercise is uh, this is part of an initiative to green the, green, green the gateway cities. And if you spend time in a lot of our gateway communities and you spend time in a lot of our urban settings, there just isn't the kind of tree canopy that you would hope to have there. Part of this was about, um, was about the beauty that comes with tree plantings, but there are other benefits to this as well. If you really want to create a great environment, plant a boatload of trees. Anybody will tell you that the single biggest and most important thing you can do with respect to dealing with CO2 is to plant trees. This is Earth Week. There are a lot of things uh, that we do year round, but I really do appreciate uh, the work that so many folks at DCR and so many folks at the local level and so many nonprofits put into turning this notion of greening gateway cities um, into a reality. And we look forward to planting 10,000 more and then 10,000 after that and 10,000 after that. Um, this is truly one of the best things we can do for our communities, for our urban streetscapes, and for our environment. And I really appreciate the heavy lifting that so many people have done to make this happen. Thank you. After serving the city of Quincy for over 55 years, Barry Welch retired from his position as Recreation Director. Mayor Thomas Koch honored Welch's service by renaming Varsity Field as Barry Welch Varsity Field. And the story comes in at number 15 on our countdown. Welcome to beautiful Marymount Park and the new Barry J. Welch Varsity Soccer Field. Uh, I was what you would refer to as the ultimate rec rat. I was the first one at the gym. Jack Kelly will attest, I know he's here in the back someplace. Uh, when it opened, the last one to leave, they had to throw me out. The summer programs were something I looked forward to uh, every single day of my entire childhood. The Quincy Recreation Department and the work that Barry Welch did uh, made a tremendous impact on my life personally. And I'm very proud not only to call him a colleague, uh, but a dear friend. And Barry, I wouldn't be here without you, buddy, so thank you. What an incredible day for an incredible man. This is a, such a beautiful uh, day, and the uh, support that he has in front of him right now just speaks to his uh, legacy that he's left. So Barry, uh, you're a lucky man. Today I've been asked to say a few words about Barry Welch, and I'm gonna keep my, remar my remarks shorter than the meeting Barry runs at the uh, Park and Rec Board meetings, <laughs> which won't be that hard. First, I'd like to say I don't know of anyone, anyone who doesn't like Barry Welch. 
I've had the pleasure of knowing Barry's, uh, Barry since our days at North Quincy High School. At North, Barry was always willing to help others. Um, his work with the Recreation Department continued with his appointment as Assistant Athletic Director of Recreation. And in 1982, he was appointed Director of Recreation, a position he held until this spring. They certainly picked the right man for the job because what the city got in Barry was a person who was dedicated, motivated, innovative, knowledgeable, and loyal. Taking over a department that was already a good one, he has left the Quincy Recreation Department as one, if not the best, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So I've had the privilege uh, of serving in various capacities in city government, uh, and uh, it's been really a pleasure. The only thing that comes close uh, to serving as the mayor of this great city, and the honor that it has, was really serving as the park director. Um, Dave and I laugh a little bit about some of the stories over the years, uh, but really serving every day in that capacity was really special. And one of the reasons was uh, working with Barry. You know, we were across the hall from each other and uh, we used to talk about a lot of different things. Uh, you know, I know in those days the park and board meetings, they would end formally, but we'd be talking for hours afterwards uh, on how we could improve things and how things could be better. Uh, Barry never lost his enthusiasm, his interest and his passion for what he does. You know, today we're dedicating a field, but in many ways, this is a lifetime achievement of what? Really think about that. How many people stay with an organization today for 55 years? It's just incredible. So I, I view this as a lifetime achievement award. I'm thrilled to have my name associated with all of those folks and to be home here in the park. It, it really, really means a great deal. Um, Participation in recreation programs by definition are voluntary, so I'd like to thank the residents of Quincy, most importantly, who supported our activities through all these years by attending our programs, and as I've said so often for many, many years, and I stole it from the great John Osgood, who's in the back, who ran our day camp, Happy Acres. Thanks for loaning us your children. It's given me a great honor, it's a great privilege to uh, have served as the recreation director and uh brendan i'll do it now thanks for coming At number 14 on the countdown, the Quincy Housing Authority unveiled new apartments aimed to help those with disabilities during a ceremony held at Sawyer Towers on Martinson Street. The renovations were made possible through a state housing grant and Quincy's Affordable Housing Trust. Um, it's nice when a plan comes together. Um, four years ago, the Housing Authority lost approximately $2.8 um, Four years Four years ago, we used to have a driver that used to come up to Sawyer Towers, pick up all the checks to be signed, and drive them up to 80 Clay Street. Um, it was not an ideal situation. Um, the finance office was here at Sawyer Towers while all the other administrative offices were up at 80 Clay Street. The funny thing is, is when you walked into the finance office, it was so obvious that it could be three units for housing. Um, it, was, it was laid out as if three units belonged there. Um, so after it became apparent that that should happen, I um, took the first step, which was to go meet with Jim Fatsies. And uh, I think I remember his words that day and said, this is a no-brainer. <laughs> and he was right. It was, it was a no-brainer. Um, presently, our finance department has moved up to 80 Clay Street and we have created a uh, ton of efficiencies by having them there. And we had this tremendous opportunity to create these three new units. Um, so when, when I went to meet with Jim, uh, we didn't only speak about these three units. These three units are part of a much larger project. It was actually six units of housing that we were creating by this funding. Um, down in Snug Harbor, we have three family units that were vacant for as long as 20 years. Uh, one of them was an old daycare facility, and the other two were offices for HRCI. This project not only created these three new 
affordable handicap units here at Sawyer Towers, but they also renovated three family units which were occupied um, by three families that were displaced uh, from the storms in Puerto Rico. Uh, and that happened over the winter, I think some of you remember um, that, uh, that event. We're going through, this region is going through a real boom in development. And I know it kind of rubs both ways. You know, we're creating more units in the marketplace, which fundamentally helps uh, people find housing units because we don't have enough in the Boston area. So even if the units new aren't subsidized, they actually are helping in the, in the respect of supply and demand. It helps to stabilize rents by putting more units in the marketplace. I think what we have to look at in, in, in this is the courage, uh, because the collateral, you know, the, the actual uh, collaboration of local and state governments, this is something that you don't hear about enough, but without DHCD, this doesn't happen. Without the ordinances in the city for affordable housing, uh, we don't have the money to fund this. Their repositioning of this asset wasn't easy. They had to move their finance office. And when I use the term, it's a no-brainer, it's a no-brainer, but it's painful. You have to move, you have to change your place of work, you have to start thinking outside the box, and that's exactly what happened. And these units are being uh, revitalized, I believe, uh, from a, an office space because they're right inside the front door. They're right where it should be to help our most vulnerable residents live a quality and wonderful life uh, amongst everybody else that's here. It's a, it's a great opportunity to put people together and to make sure that they have an opportunity to thrive, and that's, that's our intention. So at number 13 on our countdown, the annual City of Quincy Candlelight Vigil was held in October to remember those who lost their battle with addiction. The vigil not only remembers those who are lost, but aims to give hope to those still battling, support each other, and to help battle the devastation of addiction. I struggle every year wondering what to say up here because unlike most events where there is a welcome and a speech that seems appropriate, there really isn't ever one that seems to fit this occasion that we're here for. But whatever your reason for being here today, just look around and know that one thing I can guarantee is that you're not alone.
Firefighters Memorial Sunday is held the second Sunday each June and remembers those who served as firefighters in Quincy. The 2019 memorial also featured the unveiling and rededication of a new bronze memorial statue, and it comes in at number 12 on our countdown. On June 9, 1929, the Quincy Fire Department held its first Memorial Sunday and dedicated this monument to my right to the members of the Quincy Fire Department that have passed away. Ninety years ago to the day, we are here to rededicate the memorial with a beautiful new bronze statue on top of the old Granite Foundation and to continue the long tradition of honoring our fallen brothers and sisters. Second Sunday of June, I believe, is the most important day to be a firefighter. Today we get to come together and remember the firefighters that served this great city before us and have passed away. These firefighters helped pave the way to make this job what it is today. I'd also like to thank their families and all the other families out here today that have become our second family and, and helped us you know, grieve the loss of our fallen brothers in the past. I'd also like to thank the retired members in the audience today. These guys set the bar for us. They taught us. They showed us how to be great firefighters, and I thank them for that. I'm in closing. I just wanted to say a little quote that I had read. Firemen never die. They burn forever in the hearts of the people whose lives they saved. Thank you. You know, the cemetery, which was consecrated in 1855, people come from all over to visit the cemetery to look at the beautiful monuments, uh, truly at work uh, throughout this place, the history of the city as a granite capital. Uh, and, and this is also one of those great pieces. Um, if you just look at the base of this, it's a piece of work of art in itself. And of course, with the beautiful new bronze statue on top of it, it's a great visible sign to everybody that passes by here of the service the men of Quincy have given to this great city. In a very real way, we remember those that have gone before us. And in, the, uh, in the light of D-Day anniversary recently, uh, firefighters over the years, many of them have been veterans. They have been called to serve and, and have served so, so well with great dedication and fidelity. Um, so we remember all those that have gone before us. You certainly see a number of retirees out there, some great friendly faces. They all seem to be doing well. You've earned your retirement, and some of you have beat the system. Good for you. <laughs> which means you've lived long, which we love, which we love. Uh, and just a, just a note for what's behind us, uh, just an interesting fact. I was a former cemetery director, so uh, this town of Quincy that says on this holding tomb behind us, that used to hold caskets when things were too difficult in the winter to bury anybody. So the last time that was used was the blizzard of 1978. Uh, some of you may remember that storm. Uh, it was pretty amazing. So we have a great, beautiful cemetery here, and this is a beautiful, prominent spot right here on C Street for people to drive by and see. So it is said that those who are remembered are not dead. And this is a great, great visible sign of remembering all those gone before us. So enjoy the day. May God bless you all. We now ask the firefighter Sean Breslin, firefighter Mike Dwyer, to place the wreath at the monument. At number 11 on our countdown, the City of Quincy participated in Wreaths Across America. Volunteers visited cemeteries across the city to lay wreaths on the graves of the veterans of Quincy who dedicated their lives to serving the country. Right now, across the country, at more than 1,500 memorial sites like this, people are gathered as a grateful nation to remember, honor, and teach. We are all proud to live in America in a free society made up of many people from many walks of life. The freedoms we enjoy today have not come without a price. Lying here before us and in cemeteries throughout this nation are men and women who gave their lives so that we can live in freedom and without fear. 
the United States of America was founded on the ideals of freedom, justice, and equality. Our nation stands as a shining beacon of liberty and freedom to the world. Thank you to the men and women who gave their lives to keep us free. We shall never forget you. We shall remember. Many of you here with us today are veterans of wars and conflicts, and we would like to say thank you, and we are honored to stand with you here today. Right now, there are men and women serving today in all branches of our military, here at home and places far away. These men and women are part of the best trained, best equipped military in the world. We honor them and their families for the sacrifices they make each day to keep our country safe. Please keep these military members in your thoughts and in your prayers. It's certainly a great honor for me to represent, represent you as mayor of this great city, but uh, I'm sure like, like all of you, uh, it's also kind of a personal honor to be here today because like you, we have loved ones who are buried in these sacred grounds. Uh, just further that way, my, my dad, who's a World War II vet, is buried. Just over this way, I have an uncle who served in Korea and died in the VA when he returned. And just further down, a brother who was a Vietnam era veteran. So it's certainly a personal honor to, to be with you as we all remember our loved ones and remember our veterans. I also can't help but to, but to also look at the wreath. And, and to Christians, the wreath represents no beginning and no end. And we'll be celebrating Christmas uh, in just a short while. I think the meaning of Christmas was Christ bringing light into the world to take care of the darkness. And I can't help but think of the veterans over the generations who fought evil and darkness to bring that light to all corners of the earth to protect freedom. So God bless our veterans. May God continue to bless America. I'm always humbled at the crowds that uh, show up for Reads Across America. This is our fourth or fifth or sixth time that we've had the opportunity, my wife and I, to participate. The first time we did it in D.C., it was actually really cold. They gave up their free time to make sure that veterans and people that gave their life for this country had their graves decorated with a wreath. Their core values, as everybody is already talking about, is remember, honor, and teach. So I want to challenge the young people, especially the young people here. If you ever get the opportunity or are tasked with a research project, and you just don't know what you're gonna do. Come out here, look at the headstone, pick a name, and research that person. Where they're from, what they did, who their families are. And that way, we can always remember, teach others, and through that, honor the legacy of the folks that are lying here today. James R. McIntyre. Thank you for your service. Joseph P. Harrington. Thank you. At number 10, after serving as executive director since 1996, QATV's Betty Campbell retired in May of 2019. To honor and recognize her efforts, the board of directors, staff, and members of QATV held a party to celebrate Betty's 23 years at the helm. And thanks to your leadership, it's been such an important part of our community in getting the word out and educating everybody about the things we do at the State House and things going on in our community. So I bring a citation from the House of Representatives uh, that I'll read very fast. Uh, be hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives Office sincere congratulations to Betty Campbell in recognition of your well-deserved retirement after 23 years of dedicated service as the first and only Executive Director of Quincy Access TV. The entire membership expresses best wishes and hopes of good fortune and continues to in all endeavors on June 26, 2019. Well, I, I may not live in Quincy, but I always feel welcomed in Quincy. And part of that is Quincy Access Television. Uh, they've allowed a program for, about the Registry of Deeds to, to go out to all the viewers. And when I think of Betty Campbell, uh, she is Quincy Access Television. She's community committed. Uh, she provides entertainment and informative news programs and I really think 
You know, I've been around the county, there's 28 communities, there's a lot of cable uh, stations, public access uh, television. Quincy's second to none, and that's because of Betty's leadership, her vision, and the ability to put together a great team, the team of people you see. Uh, what you've done uh, with QATV is absolutely incredible. You have attracted incredible talent and kept them, and that's a tribute to your leadership. Uh, your professionalism is respected, I can tell you, throughout the state. And from a personal standpoint, I want to thank you for always just being so kind. Um, we, as, as elected officials, we're all treated fairly with generosity in terms of time and, as I say, with kindness. And um, what you've done is you have made Quincy uh, a better community. There is no doubt about that. People know about what goes on in the city. They feel connected to the city, whether it's watching um, any of the shows, the public service announcements, uh, everything that's offered. Quincy feels more like home because of what you have been able to accomplish. So thank you very much. So thank you, Betty, for what you've done, what you've established, and how you've grown QA TV from the ground up to be one of the finest public access uh, stations in the Commonwealth. Whereas Elizabeth Campbell has been a part of Quincy Access Television since its founding in 1996, and whereas Betty began her career with QATV in the role of Executive Director, a title she held for 23 years, and whereas during Betty's tenure, QATV gained national recognition, earning four regional and four national overall excellence awards for outstanding achievement in access programming. And whereas through her tireless efforts and commitment to the success of the corporation, Betty has formed countless community partnerships with local organizations and fostered a large group of dedicated volunteers who are truly the engine that keeps QATV running. And whereas her name has become synonymous with local access from her parade telecast to her omnipresence on the credit roll. And whereas it will be impossible to replace all the knowledge, dedication, and unique skills she has developed over her career. She is truly an asset to this great city and will be missed. Now therefore I, Thomas P. Koch, Mayor of Quincy, do hereby declare Wednesday, June 26th, to be Elizabeth Betty Campbell Day in the city of Quincy. <laughs> I, I'm overwhelmed by the turnout and I can't thank you enough for making these past 23 years go by so quickly and just everything that's uh, people have produced over the years has been exciting and stimulating and uh, I appreciate all the help that I've always gotten from everybody, my staff, outstanding people, each and every one of them. And you might miss me, but I'll be around. <laughs> At number nine on our countdown, Mayor Thomas Koch and Quincy Public School Superintendent Richard D. Cristofaro held a press conference to announce the city's intention to purchase 180 Old Colony Avenue from Eastern Nazarene College and transform the building into a special education center. The new facility would combine the city's special education classrooms and accommodate over 200 students. Um, today we're announcing the um purchase of this site, which you see behind me, which has been on the market for some time. Uh, Eastern Nazarene College is the owner. One of the vice presidents is here, Larry Bullinger. Larry. Uh, we're still in final negotiations through the broker, but we expect uh, to complete that sale uh, very, very soon. And uh, we'll be presenting a package to the city council on Monday night that I expect that we'll go into committee uh, for $8.5 million, which will include the purchase of the building and money for renovations and upgrades to the building uh, for the space that we're creating here. And part of the program uh, in our school system is how we care for all of our families, uh, those families that have some kids that have certain challenges, uh, and that's what we're going to be dealing with with this building. This will be a learning center for many of our children who have special needs. Today we send out uh, a lot of children to outside of our district to get the care and specialties uh, that they need with their challenges. Uh, with this building, we'll be able to keep uh, many of our kids here in Quincy without having to be on a bus uh, at least an hour or two a day uh, to and from their home in Quincy. Um, I think that is awesome just to start with. We have incredible staff and leadership that I know are going to put together an incredible team here 
uh, they'll be second to none. And at the end of the day, uh, with the acquisition cost, uh, the upgrading costs, the cost to staff the building uh, and maintain the building, we'll be saving money. So this is a win-win for the families of our city, but also the taxpayers of our city. And uh, I'm very delighted. This unique city vision allows us to enhance our special education pathways. With the wonderful space in this building at Old Colony Ave, we will be able to design and continue Quincy's dedication to our special education children from pre-kindergarten to middle school while serving many more of our students that are within the city uh, at this point in time and ensuring that our children will spend less time on transportation and more quality time with our incredibly dedicated staff. It will also allow us to enhance parent involvement with a very, very unique parent center, allow us to limit site and program transitions for our students because this will be their school. We will offer integration opportunities, the ability to bring back to Quincy Public Schools many of our students that are in outside placements. And our school system, the opportunity to collaborate with other school systems who may want to send their students to our special education program. So the mayor's right. I've had more than 32 years of experience working with or uh, working in the Quincy Public Schools, and I know this issue pretty well. And I know the kind of team that the superintendent has assembled to take care of our special education students. We have a history of doing this really well. We know how to do it. We've done it at the Early Childhood Center, which is a phenomenal location where we, where we hold so many of our great students for as long as we can. And this is going to allow us to keep so many more of those kids in our district where we know our educators and we know what they're getting. We're go I'm going to look forward to collaborating with my colleagues on the school committee, not only Mr. Rigoli and Ms. Hubley, but everybody else on the school committee and the QPAC, the Quincy Parent Advisory Council, and our special education subcommittee team to do an analysis with you of the programs and to see which things would work best here and how, and so we can offer our full support and we'd love to get busy on that work. So I thank you very much for this opportunity. I thank the mayor. I think this is visionary. I really do. We have been looking for it for a long time and we've had issues it comes up every year challenges and opportunities the superintendent brings it to us every single year to see if we can figure out where to place our programs and our kids so that we they can get the best education and we can monitor that so i really i'm thrilled about this and i'm very very happy thank you mayor at number eight on our countdown cheaper and faster internet is the wish of every subscriber but currently there are not enough options in the city of quincy during a press conference held at City Hall, Mayor Thomas Koch and Ward 3 City Councilor Ian Kane announced the start of an initiative to create a high-speed fiber network to make cheaper, faster internet a reality in Quincy. Uh, I hear constantly from people about uh, competition or lack of competition. Some, some related to cable, some related to slowness of access to, to get onto the fiber and onto the, uh, onto the network. So uh, this is something we're very serious about looking at. Uh, the city obviously is uh, a good sized city with uh, a water department, soda department, so really utility business to some extent. Um, and uh, what this is is going to open up, or does going to open up the process, if you will, for us to look seriously at um, a building our own fiber network citywide. Um, this is really a constituent and resident driven project, uh, as the mayor alluded to uh, in his remarks. There's something that we hear when we're out uh, talking to residents and constituents all the time. It's when are we getting, when are we getting fiber? When are we going to get options? When are we going to get cheaper internet uh, with better service? And unfortunately, the way that the model currently works is that large incumbents and companies own the infrastructure and they provide the service, which allows them to take advantage of you as the consumer and the customer. So what this project is really doing is separating the infrastructure from the services. So the goal would be to eventually provide residents in the city of Quincy with internet as low as $50 a month, which is something I think that everyone can get behind. We're going to uh, put forward a, a video that explains the concept of this project that we're working on. And again, I want to stress that uh, www.quincyfiber.com is the place to go for more information uh, where you can take a survey, show us your interest, and um, ask any questions therein. And we look forward to, uh, to making this initiative go forward for all the residents of Quincy. Broadband networks matter because we live in a digital economy. In the digital economy, many physical objects are getting connected to networks, sensors, and computers. In this new economy, cars become computers with wheels, farms become computers with soil, and airplanes become computers with wings. 
The information flowing from cars, airplanes, and farms becomes powerful through a connected global network. A business without a fast and reliable network can't participate effectively in the digital economy. A child who can't afford a reliable connection can't do homework. A community without robust network infrastructure can't attract the businesses or workers it wants, stifling economic growth. As a municipality, we must make it as easy as possible for people to participate in the digital economy. We do this by operating networks the same way we operate our roads. The municipality builds and maintains the roads and allows everyone to drive on those roads. The problem with our current broadband system is that large internet service providers control the digital roads and access to those roads. They use this control to block competition and keep prices inflated. We understand that broadband network infrastructure is essential to everyday life and that open networks lead to innovation, increased competition, lower prices, and faster network speeds. We're making broadband infrastructure a public utility, just like your home's water, sewer, and power connections. But we will not compete with the private sector by providing internet services over this infrastructure. No one will be forced to participate in the municipal fiber network. Residents and businesses who don't want it can opt out. Those who participate will select from a list of ISPs and internet plans based upon their needs. But here's the best part. Subscribers can switch providers and plans in less than 60 seconds, as easy as shopping online. By providing the digital infrastructure as a utility and creating real competition between ISPs, our goal is to drive down the total cost for internet access by at least 30%. And here's the best part. Once the physical infrastructure is paid off, that portion of the overall cost goes away, lowering your monthly internet bill by an additional 30 to 40%. In addition to lower internet costs, the network will facilitate additional services in the areas of healthcare, education, public safety, emergency communications, and many other applications that will drive economic growth, benefiting everyone in our community. We are creating a new digital marketplace for the private sector, an expansion of the digital economy. Any private sector company can participate, compete, and innovate in this new municipal marketplace. Our goal is to transform internet access from a system designed for the benefit of the large corporations who control these networks to a system designed for the benefit of consumers. Quincy's World War II veterans were honored and thanked for their service during the ceremony at Quincy High School. Held on Pearl Harbor Day, 30 veterans were each recognized for their service during the patriotic ceremony. The tribute comes in at number seven on our countdown. Ladies and gentlemen, the veterans we honor here today are special indeed. Not only are they the representatives and personification of America's greatest generation and all that that label includes, but these men and women are living historical institutions who served and fought in the most significant war in human history. They're not here to seek honor or recognition for themselves, but have rather chosen instead to be here to represent the brotherhood and sisterhood of all those men and women who served alongside them during the Second World War. As the son of a highly decorated World War II combat veteran, it's a tremendous sense of pride for me and honor that I now have the honor to introduce to you my dad's Quincy compatriots. Ladies and gentlemen, Russ Erickson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome 95-year-old Edward O'Toole. And this is a special occasion for him because he turned 94 yesterday. Happy birthday, Carl Awood. Please welcome John Coyne. Please welcome Richard Morrissey. The one and only Tom Shepard. Please welcome, if you would, 97-year-old, or is it 99? I can't read. 99. 99-year-old Dean Schaefer. Please welcome 97, soon to be 98-year-old Peter Sorge. Ladies and gentlemen, Lou Pasquale. Please welcome 96-year-old Jim Uveniti. 
Please welcome 95-year-old Robert Conley. Please welcome 94-year-old Pasquale DiMario. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Corporate Mildred Cox. 97-year-old Master Sergeant Fred Grenier. 95-year-old Joseph Ralph. 94-year-old Bernie Schnapper. Romeo Magnarelli. 95-year-old Charlie Santoro. Please welcome Navy veteran James Petey. He turns 91 next week. Happy birthday, Americo Speranzo. James Papil. Ralph Papil. United States Marine Corps Corporal John Barr, Jr. John. Ladies and gentlemen, United States Army veteran Russell D'Angelo. On that day, 17, 78 years ago, they were going about their lives, planning their future, carving out what they were going to do with themselves. And then the devastating news of Pearl Harbor hit sometime in the afternoon here on the East Coast. And it changed their lives forever. But these heroes answered the call of this great nation and fought and battled, knowing that the very safety of the shores that they came from was at danger. George told me at one time there was over 8,000 Quincy World War II veterans and we're down to 100. We need to ensure that their stories are remembered forever. So I implore you to get to know these folks and learn their history, because it is vital that we not forget the sacrifice of this generation. At number six on our top 25 countdown, South Shore Health held a ribbon cutting ceremony for a new medical center located at 1495 Hancock Street in Quincy Center. Part of the South Shore Medical Center network, the location offers primary care, family medicine, and a variety of other services. A little bit about South Shore Medical Center. They've been around since 1962. They're currently located in Norwell, Kingston, and Weymouth, and now in Quincy. Um, they have been a choice for South Shore residents for many years because of their quality of care, but also because of their caring and compassionate nature of how they manage patients, both keeping them free of illness, but also making sure that their wellness needs are being taken care of. So we're very thrilled to bring this expertise to this beautiful new location. I think. I mean, I walked in and I was like, wow. So I'm hoping that you all had the same reaction. This area here will now specialize in primary care. That's internal medicine, family medicine, OBGYN, and also we'll have some specialists here. So it'll be a very well-rounded place for people to receive care. Whether they need a routine checkup or they need something more complex or a wellness visit, they'll be able to do that here. We'll have x-rays, we'll have labs. Um, we'll be able to really treat and diagnose a wide variety of illnesses but also at the same time really work towards keeping the people in the community healthy. I represent the entire board in saying how grateful we are to have worked with Mayor Koch and the outstanding members of his team in making our dreams become part of this community and a reality. Quincy is a vibrant city made up of people from many cultures and we are very excited we will be working diligently to provide superior care to, uh, to the patients from diverse backgrounds, values and beliefs. Leading up to our opening next week, we have collaboratively worked with the city community leaders to tailor the delivery of care and a site at, to meet the patient's social, cultural, and linguistic needs. Last year alone, South Shore Health invested more than $2 million in wellness, prevent, wellness, prevention, and support programs to the community it serves, including the city of Quincy. And I'll pause on that to tell you that's reality. We sit in our boardroom and we had a meeting just yesterday and we have the people come in from the health system to talk to the board of directors to let, them know, let us know what we are doing for our community up and beyond just giving good health care. And we're proud of what we can do to be a part of the community. They're our friends, our family. We want to make sure that we stay and show everybody that the social health system is more than just a hospital or just a giver of care. And this is a major step forward uh, and a message to those people that though I don't see an acute care hospital, uh, there's an awful lot of gaps to fill. 
And I think this is the beginning of filling some of those gaps for the people of our city. So I'm truly grateful for that. And in the back here, there's going to be some beautiful, beautiful parks as part of this development. So going forward, both your employees and patients will be able to enjoy the beautiful public spaces. So uh, I'm truly grateful for the commitment. Looking forward to many more ribbon cuttings, uh, both with South Shore and so many other entities in our great historic city. And so congratulations and thank you for the opportunity to say hello this morning. And good morning. Thank you for actually attending this great ceremony. So primary care, I'm here to talk to you about primary care and what we're gonna be delivering here. Primary care is about building trust, trust in relationships with each individual patient. It's just not about the individual patient, but it's also the community that they come from. So a great primary care practice keeps an eye on both of those goals. And social health is intent on establishing partnerships that is moving care out of the hospital environment into the communities. To that end, it is our responsibility as a healthcare system and community partner to reimagine healthcare. We want it to be sustainable, we want it to be accessible, we want it to be of high quality. Today, South Shore Medical Center is the ambulatory arm of South Shore Health. We are made up of over 100 internal medicine, family medicine, pediatric, and specialty providers, over 100. And we do that because we're supported by an excellent, excellent support staff. Together, we put together a great deal of thought into making this location and this space comfortable and convenient. Coming in at number five on the countdown is the 10th anniversary of the Kennedy Center. Opened in 2009, the Kennedy Center has served the senior citizens of Quincy in numerous ways, hosting conferences, offering classes, a place to socialize, and a place to keep busy. Thumb. 
we'll uh, see how well you do. Uh, and then, of course, the, the parking in the back will be much, uh, much better. The site will be elevated, the parking will be paved, so the uh, getting access to the building from the rear will be much, much easier. So, uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity to say hello. Uh, thank you for allowing me to serve as your mayor. It's, uh, it's an awesome job. I'm truly, truly, uh, truly loved and truly blessed to be able to serve. Uh, I come from a family that I uh, was exposed to public service as a very young man. Uh, and I'm grateful for that because it's been a, a labor of love. We have a great city, you know, an outstanding team working on it, and we're blessed to have a center like this. So enjoy it. This is your home. God bless you all. So I just want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank you for coming in and out every day. You bring a lot of sunshine to a lot of people's lives. This is your center, and we're looking forward to the next 10 years. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. At number four, the redevelopment of North Quincy MBTA station officially broke ground in 2019 with the announcement of the Abbey, a three-building complex that will include over 600 housing units, 45,000 square feet of retail space, and 1,300 space parking garage. We are so pleased to welcome you today. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Lauren Jesnicki. I'm a senior vice president overseeing Bazito Development's work in the New England area. This is an exciting milestone for our partnership with the MBTA, which kicked off in the spring of 2016 to re-envision the next chapter for this seven acre parcel adjacent to the North Quincy Red Line Station. For the last three years, we worked diligently with stakeholders from the T, Mass DOT, City of Quincy, and Neighborhood to develop the plans for this transit-oriented mixed-use development. In honor of this great milestone, we are delighted to unveil today the new name for this new community. Inspired by Abigail Adams' amazing legacy and longtime residency in Quincy, the North Quincy Redevelopment Project will now be named the Abbey. And I have no problem with what we're doing. My biggest concern is how fast we're doing and how much of it we're doing. And in a state that's added 600,000 people to our population over the course of the past uh, 15 or 20 years, during the same period of time when we've added a fraction of new housing uh, to accommodate that, this is one of the biggest challenges we face. And while projects like this uh, are a big part of how we respond to the demand in the market and the demand from uh, the people in our communities, there's so much more to be done. Um, but today, we do have a project that's two years from beginning to today, which all by itself is, uh, is quite an accomplishment. And I want to give all the folks that are involved in this pro process and this project a lot of credit for moving the ball quickly down the field. And I'm sure, Mayor, a lot of that has to do with your leadership and with the folks on your team, because this doesn't happen if you don't have a partnership. Um, from our point of view, the opportunity associated with this project, the work we're doing all the way up and down the red line, not just on the stations, but on the tracks and the power systems and the signals and the switches and the trains and everything else, um, is going to create a terrific corridor. Uh, heading here onto the South Shore and all the way through on the other side to Alewife and uh, and I can't wait to see what this all looks like a couple years from now uh, when a lot of the work um, that's involved in it has been completed. Uh, thank you all for being here. Everywhere that our company develops we consider ourselves guests in the neighborhood and any courteous guest should bring a gift for their host. In this case our host is the wonderful city of Quincy and I certainly did not want to arrive empty-handed. For those of you that know me, you might know that I have a passion for collecting signed books and letters from people that have made a positive difference in their lifetime. Holding copies of these artifacts in your hands literally brings history alive. Abigail Adams is most certainly a person who made a tremendous difference in her lifetime. Abigail also spent a good deal of time writing her sons and those close to her, imparting her kindness and wisdom with a gentle touch. So today, we are incredibly proud to present Mayor Koch in the city of Quincy 
an original letter written by Abigail Adams to her son, Thomas Boylston Adams. We felt this letter should not be in the hands of a private collector, rather it should be here, home in Quincy. To put this letter in perspective, it was written more than 216 years ago in 1803. In this letter, she wrote about improvements she and her husband were making to the city of Quincy. Your father wishes to get you here. We are improving our town of Quincy by a new bridge and a turnpike road. We'll hang a replica of this letter in the Abbey, but hope that the citizens of Quincy will be able to enjoy the original wherever you choose to hang it. So thank you, Governor Baker, Mayor Koch, and the city of Quincy for being such extraordinary hosts. We look forward to this beautiful project together. At number three on our countdown, middle school students in Southwest Quincy moved into their new home this fall with the opening of Southwest Middle School. A ribbon cutting ceremony was held to welcome the community and honor individuals who served at the former Sterling Middle School, including George DiPaolo, who served at the school as a custodian for 60 years. Welcome and good afternoon. My name is Dr. John Franciscini, the very proud principal of Southwest Middle School. On behalf of Assistant Principal Sue Foley, our teachers, and most significantly our students, we welcome you to this formal dedication ceremony. Today we are brought here in fulfillment of a dream of our students and the families of Southwest Quincy community to have a new school. Through the years of planning and tremendous support and leadership of our mayor, our superintendent, our state and city officials, this dream has become a reality. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, it's a beautiful light moment here in the gym on a dark, dingy day. Uh, and uh, it's just such an incredible day for all of us to come together and celebrate another great day for the city, another great day for education, another great day for the kids of our city. That's what we're here for today. Uh, so today we have a, a few speakers you're going to be hearing from. Uh, we had an incredible team on this, and I know that good Dr. Superintendent will probably mention some of that, but in a number of pro public projects we've overseen over the years, there's been none as seamless and flawless as this has been. It's remarkable, the team that came together from all aspects. So we're so proud of that work. So, so what really matters as we celebrate here today, what really matters is that we are thankful for our students, staff, principal, John Francisini, and former assistant principal, Courtney Mitchell. All were so considerate and so professional during this construction process. What matters is that our city holds in its heart the respect, the dignity, and such high esteem for each and every student here at Southwest, and certainly in all of the Quincy Public Schools. What matters is that Quincy always cherish its past while moving forward thoughtfully with our school system. What matters is that our schools in every neighborhood offer positive cultures, excellent educators, caring staff and families, and always community connections. In all of these, Southwest is an outstanding example. Also in the program, and you just need to look through the glass to see the name George H. DePaulo Auditorium. George attended the school when it was South Junior, graduated from Quincy High School in 1940, went on to serve uh, his nation in the military, uh, was involved in the D-Day invasion, was involved in the Battle of the Bulge, received all kinds of merits and stars, and just an incredible American patriot who came back to work here for 60 years as a custodian. He, he kept it like it was his own home. Remarkable individual. I think his wife is here with us today, Mrs. DiPaolo. My name is Frank Flora. My grandfather was George DiPaolo and he was a janitor here for 60 years and this meant a lot to our family having you know, this um, named after him here and uh, beautiful school. Really excited uh, for the neighborhood and for the city of Quincy. At number two on our countdown, workforce housing received a big boost in 2019 with the opening of the Watson, an apartment complex in Quincy Point with a large number of units priced for those earning at or below the area's median income. The name the Watson was given to this development by our former city clerk and town historian Joe Shea. You see the Four River Shipyard was located across the street and the original owner of the shipyard was a man named Thomas Watson. 
who was famous for receiving the first phone call from Alexander Graham Bell. At NeighborWorks, we've been working in Quincy since 1980 and have always been focused on community redevelopment. Our philosophy and mission is quite simple. We partner with local residents, government, and private business to get things done for the people in our neighborhoods. I started off uh, in public housing, you know, and in workforce housing back in the day, uh, in the old colony housing projects in South Boston. And this, this is really a dream. Uh, this is really, thinking about the affordable component here, workforce housing, this is really what we aspire to. I remember, uh, not only did I grow up in public housing, my mom, dad, five sisters, uh, it, was a, it was a different model back then. It was, we were sort of warehousing people and it really wasn't giving people opportunities. So I ended up running for state rep. That's how I got my, my start in politics, around public housing, about, around workforce housing, around the dream of, of, of the Watson. You know, we didn't really know what it looked like back then, but we had an idea that, that we need to connect families to jobs and to the economy and to transportation to really fulfill their lives, not just warehousing people. Yes, it's true. You've got to cobble together a lot of resources. Um, these are public-private partnerships. They're federal, state, and city partnerships. There's a whole bunch of cooks in the kitchen to make this happen. But in this particular case, uh, you had a whole bunch of people working on this who were very committed to a very similar set of goals and objectives based on the vision for this site. And this is uh, really exciting for all of us to be thinking about working families, individuals, really thinking about how we get our kids out of the basements and um, places that they could go. And so um, looking forward to Mass Housing continuing to working with the development community, our legislators to continue to create great projects like this. Thank you. So we moved in since we've been here November 1st. Um, it has been an amazing experience. The amenities, the apartment, we feel safe. It's everything that I was looking for. And most importantly, it was affordable. Um, I'm now working with a lot of young people who are graduating from our partner with BC Donovan who are graduating with their masters and they are struggling with finding places to stay. So I'm hoping that the city of Quincy and Massachusetts continue to put programs like this in place um, for those of us who don't make enough to afford market rate, but make too little for other governmental um, funded programs and that the workforce housing program um, continues to blossom. Most of these programs do not exist in other states. Massachusetts, Mass Housing, has middle income workforce money that simply doesn't exist. We work in 23 states. This is the only state that a project like this could have occurred in. If you looked, you would say, wow, we have a, a diverse group of people here. That's great. But if you observed, you'd understand that this is truly unique. 20% affordable, 60% middle income, 20% market. It's a bell curve. As we talk about income inequality, as we talk about people of, uh, living in cities of the rich and poor, the Watson is the bell curve, where the most amount of people are in the middle. It's how it should be. And we should be very proud that we were able to pull it off. Well, we reached the top story on the Quincy in Focus 2019 Year in Review Countdown. As you can see, there were several big stories that happened in Quincy this past year. There certainly were a lot of big stories, but one topic in Quincy has been on the top of most of the list this past number of years, and that's the redevelopment of the Quincy Center. In early 2019, the redevelopment of Quincy Center took a step forward in February with the announcement that Fox Rock intends to build a 200,000 square foot building as a part of the redevelopment of the former Ross Parking Garage. The building will be the future home of the South Shore Health System and Brigham Health Partners Healthcare Initiative to bring community-based health care to Quincy. Today we're here to talk about the major commercial venture, more than 450,000 square feet. We saw the demise of Quincy Medical over the years, and since that time, we've had a tremendous vacuum of medical services. Uh, people have to leave the city to get some very basic medical needs taken care of. That's about to change. Absolutely delighted and thrilled to have with me today uh, some distinguished folks who are going to talk a little bit more in detail 
about this 450,000 square feet uh, Fox Rock development is going to be developing. Uh, it has been a lot of work to date. I want to thank all the teams that have been involved. Uh, this is not easy stuff. Uh, this is complicated. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts. And it takes a great effort from all sides to get to this point. On the big screens behind us is a rendering of a proposed development that Fox Rock released in December. That rendering is for the north portion of the Ross parking garage parcel here in Quincy Center. And the centerpiece of that proposed development is a 200,000 square foot medical office building. South Shore started as a hospital, 1922, a few years behind Quincy. But we have always been here in some form or fashion. Right now with our home health, we did uh, almost 2,000 patients in their Quincy homes in the last 12 months. But the part of it is exactly what he said. When you need health care, you need it in your home or your environment and in your community. But you also need to have connections so that if we can't take care of you, through our clinical affiliations that we have, we get you to the place that you need to be but only when you need to be, because everyone wants to be taken care of near their home, near their families, and in their community. So that's why this partnership works. We've done it in Weymouth, and we're so happy to be invited to do it in Quincy. Our relationship with South Shore Health System began in 2005, so we've been at this now for almost 15 years. It began because we had a shared belief that the development of community-based health care would allow us to ensure that every patient got the right care and the right place at the lowest cost. Over the past 15 years, we have worked together to bring world-class specialty care to people in the South Shore in women's health, cardiovascular care, neurology, and of course, cancer care. Uh, this is a great day for the city of Quincy, folks. Uh, we've been talking about a transformation of Quincy Center for more than three decades. We're seeing it before our eyes, but today is the icing on the cake. We're bringing great jobs, commercial growth, and medical service for the people of this great city. Uh, so we look forward to coming weeks uh, and the next steps from here. Uh, we'll be going to the city council with a land disposition agreement, uh, but also with the next phase of requests for DIF monies to build out some of the infrastructure and roadways, uh, and also an, uh, an amendment to the URDP district, urban redevelopment district, uh, to reflect the changes uh, going forward. That's all for this year's top 25 countdown of stories covered on Quincy in Focus. QATV is already working on stories for 2020, some of which are bound to make the top 25. If you'd like to help create a story to air or would like more information about Quincy Access Television, visit our website at qatv.org or call 617-376-1440. My name is Sherry Kajust. And I'm Mandy Flaherty. Thanks for watching this edition of Quincy in Focus. From the Board of Directors and staff at Quincy Access Television, have a happy new year.